about 15 years ago, I went to a, a streaming media conference. Um, someone pitched the idea of this is what the future looks like, the ultimate future. You know, we'll be watching uh, something like Wimbledon at work, quietly on our computer. Uh, when we come to commute home, we'll be able to fire up some de mobile device and watch it on there. And then when we get home, we'll be able to continue watching on the big screen. And everyone was, wow, that'll, you know, if that ever happens, that'll be amazing. <laughs> and yet, we're kind of there now, aren't we, really? Certainly with Netflix, it seems to know where I've got up to and I can watch it on different devices. So for our closing panel today, I kind of want to ask the question, where next? And who's going to, who's going to work out where we're going next? In uh, a nod to BAFTA is a quote from a film. See if you can identify this. The past can hurt, but from the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Do you know where that comes from? The Lion King. Ted? The Lion King. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> Rafiki <laughs> talking to the young Simba. Um, and, I, and it made me think about 3D TV and for those that are involved in 3D TV and just how they're feeling at the moment, whether they feel they've got to run for it or run from it, or whether they're actually gonna learn from it. But our panel is uh, gonna help us work out things for the future based on their past experience, based on their current experience, to give us a really good idea of um, you know, where we should be looking at and whether some of these buzzwords that we're hearing about are that important or whether they're just technology for technology's sake. So what I'd like to do, please, to ask my panel to introduce themselves and give me a little bit of, or give us a little bit of understanding about how you've used online video uh, in the past and just what you're doing at the moment, just, you know, for a couple of minutes each. So we'll start with Maria. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Engold. Uh, I run a technical consultancy called Mirality. And uh, prior to that, I'm the former CTO of FilmFlex Movies, so I delivered the video on demand film infrastructure for Virgin Cable and Channel 4's Film 4 on Demand. And I'm now helping deliver video on demand for places like South Africa and uh, globally. So, but where I came from, my degree is actually in computer science and fine art. Um, and that was definitely done in America because over here they thought I was insane. Uh, and so I've always been working in visual technology. It's what I'm passionate about. And about, I started in technology about 23 years ago, working at IBM, working the beginnings of multimedia, 32-bit operating systems. Uh, joint spec that we created with a little tiny company that nobody thought would be a threat called Microsoft. You might have heard of it. A little bit bigger now. And uh, there's actually, if you get a chance to go onto my blog, which is mirality.com slash blog, I've got a post called uh, From 320 by 240 to 4K. And damn, we were excited about doing 320 by 240 by 15 frames a second by 8-bit, and by 8-bit I mean 256 colors. That was so much better than 16. And we had come up from dealing with hardware, I mean, you know, we had to have hardware encoding for that. This is something I prepared earlier, you will see this a few times. This is 320 by 240, this is 4K. Just to give you a feel for that. <laughs> and, um, we were very excited about it, but we had to use hardware technology to, to be able to, to do the encoding, to do the, to do the decoding. And eventually, we started doing things in software. And it's kind of funny, because when I wrote the article, I was talking about 4K, and here we are having to use hardware uh, decoding for 4K. But we're just where we were 20 years ago. You know, we're going to be back to software. It's going to cycle through again. Uh, and then I you know, ended up in computer games and all sorts of other things, but visual technology has been my love and my passion. Hi there, I'm Luke Gaydon. Um, I'm from Brightcove. Uh, we help companies distribute uh, video over the top. Um, I've been at Brightcove for six years. Uh, prior to that, I was at Channel 4, which is where I got my first taste for online video, um, selling the unsuspecting public uh, packages of uh, Big Brother clips, uh, which were um, insanely and surprisingly popular because the user experience to, uh, to access and to, uh, to be able to download as it was then and watch your clips was the most horrible um, mix and muddle that you've ever seen. You had to register and then you got an email and you had to confirm your email address and that didn't work and the service fell over. And it was, um, it was amazing to me, you know, looking at that 
experience then um, and now you know to Maria's point sort of looking to where we've sort of moved to in terms of um, just the sort of the, the capabilities and the services that are available now um, that you know there has particularly I think in this user area of user experience been such um, enormous improvement um, and the expectation on the parts of the consumer um, are now so much sort of higher when it comes to accessing these sorts of services. Um, I've um, uh, I've always been fascinated by television um, in the sense that I've always loved watching it. Um, and I remember my favorite sort of televisual moment was uh, when I was seven years old, uh, turning on the TV. I think there were three channels, Channel 4 launched that. No, I don't think it had, so three channels. Um, and El Cid had just started, it was about five minutes in. Um, and I was so excited because I'd never turned the television on to something that I actually wanted to watch, you know, then and there. <laughs> Um, and I've never forgotten how amazing that was. And if you now, you know, contrast that experience with where we are now, um, you almost wouldn't dream of turning on the television unless there was something that you wanted to watch at that particular time. And of course, you, you know, you can do. Um, and so I think, you know, that again is very interesting, sort of contrast and parallel to where we are now. So, um, yeah. And hi, I'm Genevieve Smith from BAFTA. Um, I'm, as it says, there, I'm a digital marketing and content manager. So I'm very much across. Um, all of the content that BAFTA is producing um, during our award season, that can be all of our digital uh, content around our awards that's filmed both in the run-up and then on the red carpet, on the night, backstage, etc. And then also um, editor of BAFTA Guru, which is our kind of our learning website, so it's there to service anybody who wants to get into the film, TV or games careers. Um, it's there to provide inspirational content. Um, and just thinking about, so I joined BAFTA about three years ago, maybe coming up to four. Um, at that point, BAFTA was doing video stuff on, on, on the web. <laughs> um, at the time, I think the, it was more about we ought to film. It just felt like this thing we ought to be doing because other people were doing it. Now, obviously, BAFTA, can, you can see it in two ways. We obviously do recognise the very best in the business, but then there's also BAFTA internally trying to film stuff ourselves and try to figure stuff out for ourselves in some ways about content strategies. Um, so about... Six years ago, content was filmed. It would be an event with a locked-off camera. It would be turned around and put online, and that would be it. Um, it's gone from, from that sort of thing through to now where we think about, actually, what do we want out of this event? Do we want just a 60-second interview with this person? Do we want to do a, a Twitter Q&A? It's not actually just about video for us anymore, although obviously that is, that is still key. Um, it's about really sort of what, what's the best content we can produce from our events and how can we turn that around and put it online in the most engaging way that's really going to appeal to our uh, target audiences. Shall I put up a couple of your slides? Yeah, so I just did a couple of through. screenshots. Um, uh, let's see. This that's one. the ones there. I just thought I'd, it was just interesting, I thought, to screenshot um, the what's become BAFTA Guru website through the years. So this is six years ago. I just sort of actually, unfortunately, I did find this online, so it's still surfacing around there somewhere. This um, was what BAFTA Guru, which was then called Access All Areas, looked like about uh, six years ago. Um, as you can see there, the player doesn't really quite fit in the space anymore, that's because our website has slightly been changed since then, but we used proprietary video players back then. Um, we, it was all about trying to get people to come to our website. We wanted them to all come to us and watch the content on, on, our, on our slide, on our pages. Um, we put a little bit of content around it, but pretty much we just stick it up. We didn't think too much about the titling of it. Um, it was kind of just as it says on the tin. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, about four years ago, uh, we created this website, BAFTA Guru, um, which was very much about taking all that content and trying to push it out. As you can see, it, it has become a bit content richer. We've got much more content on there. Um, but still, not. I mean, as you look at it now, it looks quite out of date. I mean, both the styling of it, um, it's not mobile responsive, which is obviously now a huge sort of problem for us. Um, and the content is just sort of a bit small and bitty. And then if you go to the third slide, this is actually a sneak preview of the site we're going to be launching um, late August, early September. As you can see, it's sort of it's just content rich. It's much more about smaller bits of content. It's about pulling content from our archives. It's about looking at our titling of it. How do we sort of present it to our audience using really rich images? Um, it's it's video, it's article, it's audio, it's Twitter, it's face, you know, it's Facebook. It's about becoming social first. Um, and I thought it's just nice to quickly just sort of show that that change that we've got across the sites. So when you're, when you're creating all this content, I'm guessing that your BAFTA is synonymous with quality, and you give awards for quality, I guess, whatever quality may be. Um, what does that mean when you have to make content yourself? Because now you can begin to deliver stuff in standard definition or HD, and maybe in the future, and we'll come on to that in even better than HD. 
what does that, what does that actually mean for, for normal people trying to make programs? Particularly yeah. when you're doing it under the umbrella of BAFTA, which kind of says, look at me, I'm really brilliant at doing it, doesn't it? Absolutely. It was something we, we, we still struggle with to a certain extent and did certainly struggle with. We, we got to a point where we thought, well, we can't put this out unless it was absolutely perfect. Um, you know, we wanted the content to be in the best quality. We wanted it to be beautifully edited, shot three cameras, which way, whatever else. So it would mean that uh, we do a life in pictures with someone, let's say with Paul Greengrass, that was most, our most recent one. And in the past, we, we take about three or four months before we could put that content out. We'd have to go and get clearances for all our clips. We wanted it to be shot with three or four cameras. We put it out. By that point, people were still interested, but less interested because the moment it had gone, everyone had moved on to the next life in pictures event or whatever else is going on. The content didn't get that many views, so actually cost per view to us was quite high. And although it looked beautiful, there's kind of no point if no one's watching it. And we spoke to our BAFTA board about this, and interestingly, they said, we don't actually care. We, we would prefer you to get out quicker. If the quality's not up to the 100% perfect, whatever is the latest sort of HD, 4K, whatever, it doesn't matter. Much better to actually do a quick turnaround, get that content out, get it to the people who, who want it. So we really took that on board and, and we're trying now to turn around our content much quicker. We do obviously try to film in HD or the best quality we can, but we're not going to beat ourselves up actually if, if something needs to be filmed on an iPhone, for example. If we're going to get that perfect piece of content, it's going to be on an iPhone because Kate Winslet happened to walk into BAFTA that day and that's all we had. Well, let's put it out anyway. You know, it's about the content that matters rather than for us the, the quality. Obviously, that is still important to us, but content first. Content first. So um, please, this is the last panel of the day. You're more than welcome any time to put your hand up and ask questions. I've got a few canned questions if you're feeling lazy, but please do participate as well. Uh, Marie and Luke, do you, do you agree with Jen's view that, well, that, you know, content clearly is, is vital, but the quality of content is not really the most important thing? Technical quality, the however many pixels it is or frames per second. It's funny, I remember seeing a few years ago some statistics on on Netflix and why people were, you know, what they what they got out of Netflix. And they thought that Netflix's quality at that time wasn't great, um, but they were willing to trade that for what they got and the price and things like that. So I think it I think it depends on on what your what your other prerogatives are. And there's some things like I helped launch 3D onto Virgin uh, before Sky launched 3D. Um, and just because we can doesn't mean that, that everybody's going to start using it. So uh, it, was, it was easy enough for us to launch because 3D uh, fits into HD. So you've got left and a right eye, and that fits into a nice little HD frame. And you can just give, deliver them HD and then, and then make sure that you're displaying that on a 3D television, that you've got the glasses to watch it, but just because it was technically relatively straightforward doesn't mean that, that everybody wants to watch something in 3D. And I did loads and loads of encoding and transcoding tests for SD and HD when I was, and 3D when I was delivering that to, to Virgin. And you get loads of different types of, um, different codecs give you different types of quality, uh, all of that. Um, obviously, HD looks great, and of course, HD on Virgin at that time was 18.1 megabits per second because it's MPEG-2, you know. And uh, we dropped that down to 14.1 um, because uh, we needed to fit more things onto the regional head end, and so it was looking at sort of like, well, how much, um, you know, how much of a quality difference is that going to is that going to make to the end consumer? And up close, I can tell. I mean, they had me sort of come in and with film flex content, uh, movie content, to try to say, is this any, you know, can we drop it? Is it okay? Can, do, you, do you approve? Because I spent so much time looking at things. Right here, I can see it. I can see the difference. Ten feet away? Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're a real video file, you will see it. But um, I think some of these things about sort of moving to 4K, it depends what television you have, what experience you have, what you want mm -hmm. to do. You know, sometimes SD is the appropriate thing to be watching in. Is it? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, if you're trying to record... What times are, what times record, are they? Record 500 things onto your limited PVR okay. storage space, and you want to be able to watch all of that, you know. Um, but if you, you know, if you do that, then you have, and you have to walk over to the television to read the text that was sent, then that's not particularly good. So... Okay, so, 
So Luke, clearly as a technology provider um, and a retailer of gigabytes, you may have a slightly different perspective. Um, yeah, everybody should use the highest <laughs> rendition possible um, <laughs> because that's good. Um, I think that it entirely depends, and I sort of supporting um, Jen's um, point here, I think it entirely depends on what sort of content is, uh, what sort of content it is, and what the objective of that content is. Um, we work with uh, a cinema chain who um, sort of do very high-end um, films. Uh, they're a sort of small independent uh, chain. And we provided them with some sort of advice and guidance around what their encoding setup should be in order to give the best possible uh, user experience for the broadest number of people. And they ignored them completely because they uh, did not want their content to be seen unless it was seen at absolutely the best possible quality. Now that meant that somebody who didn't have a good enough internet connection or a good enough device or whatever was going to get a lousy experience and they didn't care because they only wanted it to be seen if it was going to be watched in absolute, you know, it was very, very sort of high, um, uh, high HD. Um, on the other hand, um, again to, to Jen's point, um, if the importance is getting something out as quickly as possible, then you're going to sacrifice a little bit of quality for speed if you have a breaking news story. Equally, um, if you, uh, th and this is a real life example, it was the Farnham Air Show and some um, you know, um, trade magazine was sort of covering it, and somebody got a clip um, of the stealth fighter as it flew over, not very stealthy, um, and sent it into the magazine. Of course, you know, it was shaky, it was not very good quality, but you know, this was something completely unique. Um, I do think that there is, you know, there are um, unfortunately economic considerations around the, uh, the question of quality, um, both in terms of, you know, to, to the user and also to the content distributor. And I think um, the onus is unfortunately on the likes of Brightcove to make sure that those are well understood and that there is an intelligent discussion uh, around that. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the, you know, if we talk about some of the technologies um, that are coming out now as regard, you know, around, um, you know, uh, higher quality and some sort of compression, some of the most interesting impacts, I think, of those are what they mean to things like storage costs and so forth. And that, I think, is very important because, you know, the less money that is spent on things like storage, hopefully the more money is spent on great content and compelling user experience, etc. So, Jen, do you get excited by H.265? <laughs> <laughs> In a, no. No. <laughs> so, so when people start to get excited about being able to store twice as much content in the same space or... or as an end user, as a publisher, as a, bro a broadcaster in a way, does it go just past you and it's a, it's a geeky thing? Yes and no. I think we, we don't let it worry us too much at the moment. I mean, we're, we're aware of the conversations around 4K, but you know, ultimately BAFTA's a charity and there's about five people working on our team trying to produce lots of content mm. like this. And we, we just, we can't really, we don't have time to worry about should we be filming in 4K right now? I think actually the quick answer is no, because not enough people can consume in 4K. Um, for us, you know, our biggest concern is there's hundreds of people out there, everyone can film now, and I think, you know, if even phone quality is good enough that we have to be concentrating completely on how good is our content, because we're being judged next, you know, by the next person who's also creating something, so we have to make sure that our content is as good as it can be, and, you know, it's as different as it can be as well. We don't want to be doing producing the same thing that everyone else is producing. So 4K, if, am I right? 4K, to be sure of the understanding, there's ultra high, de ultra high definition, there's 4K, there's even a bigger one called 8K, and no doubt there'll be even more of them. But 4K is, is what cinemas, digital cinemas tend to show, is it? Cinema person or anybody else? There's We're different flavors of the 4K spec with different resolutions and different aspect ratios. Okay. So paint, paint a broad picture. The number of horizontal pixels in a in a 4K. <laughs> <laughs> my glamorous See, this is assistant. Why I made this. I'm like, I'm gonna need this. Yeah, you're right. Right. Okay. This is on the website. If you really want to <laughs> on my blog, this is not quite as big as I was hoping for. Um, but yeah. So remember, 320 by 240, SD, NTSC, and PAL because of course they're different. Um, HD, and then we had full HD. Um, and 
in the same way, we've you know we've we've um, got got other things as well coming on now, which are you know slightly slightly different. So we've got full HD and 2K, which are slightly different. So full HD, of course, you know, is 1920 by 1080. 2K is 2048 by 1080. And if you take that and you put together four of them, then you get 4K. But 4K is a one one nine one aspect ratio. It is not 16 by 9. So if you want to deal with um, a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, then you need Ultra HD. And Ultra HD is 3840 uh, 3, by 2160, and 4K is 4096 by 2160. You've got that. There'll be a test so, afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. There is, there is this. It's on the website. It's, it's really easy to look at. But then there's a whole bunch of different things around 4K, which are slightly different aspect ratios, which means that the resolution is, is slightly different okay. as well. So, and then 8K is take another, you know, take four of these, you know, and then you, you know, IBC should have, uh, this all started with IBC, they should have super high vision and then everybody went, we need 8K. And then they went, well, maybe 4K first. So can I just say, for those who are watching the webcast in SD, uh, Maria was pointing at a bit of paper with lots of grey rectangles on. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my blog, it, it's much easier then. <laughs> Go look at it. <laughs> The, the, if it is digital, if roughly 4,000 along the bottom and a couple of thousand up and down, yeah. if it's kind of roughly that, and that is roughly the same as digital cinema, um, is it scary, Jen, or, or Luke or Maria, is it scary, do you think, for people that have laboured to create a, a film to suddenly find that the, the qual that sort of quality is available online? Do um, mm. you get any comments about the fear factor around piracy and all sorts that yeah. this enables? What do you think? I think that content's going to be online, and yes, there's, there's going to be priority, but I think they need, you know, rather than bury the head, or I think, like, don't do what the music industry did, basically, mm. which was kind of to bury their heads and then find themselves sort of, oh, actually, look, it's happening, we're going to have to go with it. I think, um, you look at examples like uh, Ben Wheatley's A Field in England, so he released that on the same day across all different formats. You've got to be able to basically mm. give that content to people in the format they want it, on the day it's released, and I think holding it back is, is the issue. Yeah. Yeah. So cinemas, rather than or, or producers, rather than worrying about piracy, need to need to think more about actually what, what what do people want? What will stop piracy? Actually, I think one of the ways is always going to be piracy. People are always going to down, download. But I think the majority of people want to pay for content. I would say, but it's just about it's sometimes. I mean, I've done it before. <laughs> I have actually gone away and, and tried to download something because it's just not around it. I wanted an episode yeah. of The Good Wife. It wasn't on 4AD anymore. And I was like, where can I watch this episode of The Good Wife where uh, I can get back then, to the 4AD? Stop then, stop then. Yes, before you <laughs> <laughs> get it. Exactly. That's a hypothetical. So, yeah, <laughs> it happens. People do it. So I think, basically, you need to give the content and yeah. to, the, to, to people in the, in, and deliver it in a way that people want it. I think the Field in England example is good for that. So he put it out in cinemas. On the same day it was released on DVD, you could pick it up online. You could download yeah. it from his website. And I think that's the way that people need to go about it, rather than sort of just getting scared and thinking, oh God, you can get really good quality online, I need to try and batten down the hatches. Actually, yeah. no, do the opposite. Maria, yeah. you agree? There, yeah, there are three reasons typically why people pirate content. One, they look at content and go, it's online, online should be free. And, you know, there's, there's not so much you can do about that other than educated. But the other is availability, because you know, I've been explaining rights windows for years, but you know, not everybody in the in, in, who's not in the industry understands rights windows. Why can't they get something? You know, why can't you get you know the last series of Supernatural in this country? It's it's not there. I mean, Breaking Bad. You know, uh, clearly that was popular when you could get access to it. And the other thing, is, the third one is people want to watch it how they want to watch it. So they want to watch it in the country that they want to watch it in on whatever device. And if all of those things are available, then you, you start reducing the piracy. As you can see with, like, Sandvine's report on Netflix, you know, you're obviously seeing BitTorrent drop down fairly significantly. You're seeing Netflix um, use of, of download bandwidth increasing um, because it's now, there's now legal alternatives to be able to consume that content. But you've got places like South Africa where uh, BitTorrent is fairly high, one, because a lot of the content isn't available. Um, there's some video on demand in the country. But the other thing is, is because so few people have broadband, um, it's 2% of the population, uh, and it's pretty slow. People want to download stuff using peer-to-peer -peer onto a device and then share it. 
using hard disks with, with other people. And so you're dealing with, you know, trying to figure out, you know, in that type of environment, you need to build the infrastructure, you know, and a lot of that's government related, um, you know, there's no local loop unbundling yet, there's, you know, there's got to be all those things put into place. So the studios are very aware that, that piracy is happening. Um, they've been trying to collapse some of those rights windows, doing exactly what you were saying about um, doing simultaneous releases. Um, you still have a lot of the cinemas saying, um, we're, you know, we don't want to do this, but uh, because they're afraid of it impacting cinema sales, mm -hmm. but box office sales are decreasing as, you know, and as, as, as our bricks and mortar physical media sales are decreasing and you're starting to see more on the on-demand side. Have I left anything for you to say? <laughs> uh, I was just kind of trying to work it out. No, I mean, I think, um, you know, the sort of the, the uh, old school sort of view of content piracy is, you know, is dreadful quality and sort of shaky mm. camera and, and so forth. And obviously, you know, that's in you know, times have, have moved on. Um, I think the it's it's difficult. It's, it's easy to say, um, respect to Jen's point, it's easy to say, don't be afraid of it. You know, um, look upon this as an opportunity to reach new audiences in new ways, uh, create new uh, viewing habits, you know, binge mm -hmm. viewing being a really good example. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, businesses, a lot of sort of economies that are built around the current um, mechanisms for releasing that kind of content. So I think that there is a, um, you know, I think that there is a little way to go there. But what I, you know, what I would say is that um, the 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 desire for high quality content and the willingness, the increasing willingness to pay for it, and the increasing willingness to use sort of new services and new devices um, has got to be a good thing in the context of the creation of more high quality content. And mm -hmm. I think that I would say that was the most important thing. Yeah. So one quick question to to Maria because I don't understand this, but in rights, would a, of an S4 platform be able to get UHD content or would they, would they have to pay more for it? Is it a higher value product? Uh, it, it depends on how you're doing your deals. So you can have minimum guarantee deals, mm. you can have uh, revenue split deals. Um, so the paying more just depends on, and SVOD, is in the library rights window, which means that it tends to be older content. So the current window tends to be latest release content. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, current re the current release stuff that's just come out of cinema, just come onto DVD, tends to require higher levels of security. And as you go from SD to HD to 4K, you, get more, you have more security requirements in, in place. Right. Uh, so, uh, typically for a first rights window, you, you, you definitely have to have uh, DRM uh, copy protection, uh, output protection on the, on the devices. Um, the studios are using essentially Movie Labs um, enhanced content specification um, to specify what they want for 4K, that's sort of the basic thing. I mean, they don't, you know, they don't have to comply with everything, but that's sort of the base specification they're now using for 4K. So that could include additional things like, like watermarking and stuff like that, just to try to make sure that things are secure. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is about finding out <coughs> things, that some of it is about trying to prevent things ahead of time. Um, and so uh, that would be things like DRM. Some of the other things are about stopping things after they happen, so that's revocation. Um, but then watermarking and fingerprinting allows you to, to do things about tracking back to where it came from, and it can come from some of these gorgeous original source material, as you're saying. It's no longer just somebody sitting in a cinema, but then if somebody's doing that too with a camera, then you need to be able to do a, a digital fingerprint that says the person in this cinema who was sitting in seat, you know, J4 is the person who did the, the, the <laughs> video capture. So I used to work in broadcasters. And we, uh, by the way, can you put your hand up if you are a broadcaster or almost part of the broadcast chain? Thanks. So, we, you know, you're audited for security, aren't you? You're, you're very careful what happens to the masters. 
Uh, and now we seem to be in a strange situation where we can actually deliver the master online. To me, that seems a bit of a weird thing, because even if it is DRM protected or whatever, you stick it on a, an Ultra HD monitor, and it can't be that easy to, you know, that hard to, to rip it off, and suddenly you've got the master to, you know, to a, a feature film, and, and like you're saying in um, other territories, uh, even cable TV companies could download it off the internet and put it on a server mm -hmm. and start playing it out as part of their film channel. Is it literally impossible to close the door on that sort of thing? I mean, Henry, you're nodding? Yeah, I, I, I think it probably is. And I think the interesting thing is, as we've kind of gone from SD to HD, has, has that kind of requirement kept up? Because I think it's kind of eroded a bit over time. When, when we first started looking at HD content, there were very, very strict measures around that. Mm -hmm. But over time, we've got a bit more relaxed about that as we've gone into the next four months. I think one of the interesting things will be, you know, especially when we're thinking about different ways of, of, of going about distributing content and everything else, will will that erode? I think everyone's really, really quite paranoid and quite strict mm -hmm. around 4K at the moment, which I think I, I can understand why. Um, but will that will that erode over time? And will we actually get back to a place where 4K just becomes what SD is now and it's kind of freely distributed? Mm -hmm. I try and ask Exodia that question, and they laughed at me. Oh, you yeah, know, will, sure. will you yeah, will yeah. you reduce <laughs> the the requirements for HD? You know, now that 4K is coming out, you what? <laughs> No, they weren't fond of that. But yeah, I, I predict exactly what you're saying, that over time, it, things might become easier. But then by the time things become easier, the technology is standard. Yeah, there'll be something else. So, you know, we will have, you know, out of that works. You know, we will have... It's, it's not always about going forwards in a, in a continuous line, though, is it? Sometimes you do make a mistake. And, uh, you know, well, not you personally, I'm sure you don't, but sometimes many of us <laughs> make mistakes. And the technology choice that seems so obvious... Oh, yeah wasn't the right thing. And I think what we're talking about in, in mm. UHD, don't forget that I'm probably going to need a, need a TV about this size mm. before I can even see it. So therefore I'm going to need a new house before I can adopt <laughs> UHD. You need to move to America, actually, because <laughs> you're going to need a really big room. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so, what, you know, frankly, what's the point? Um, the majority of the people in the world can't watch it, apart from a small top tier that are watching... I don't know, Breaking Bad or uh, House of Cards all over again because they've got nothing else to watch on their H Ultra HD TV. <laughs> is it strategically, is it something we should consider or should we just put it in a file, mark 2017 and open it up again in a few years' time? Panel, what do you reckon? So, uh, to the extent that it is a, uh, you know, it's a, a sort of a practical way of consuming content right now, then yeah, potentially, yes, you should put it in a, a box mark 2017. Um, because, you know, as anybody who's, you know, who's tried to consume content over a variety of devices, it's not, it's not a great experience. The other thing is, you know, you need, uh, you know, the content needs to be made in that, uh, at that quality in order for it to, you know, for it to work. So, you know, is the addressable audience for that quality, you know, for that level of quality small? Yes. Uh, does that mean that we should sort of halt production and kind of, you know, stop everything until that addressable audience is, is bigger? N no, I don't think so, because uh, you know, presumably um, the drive towards making that addressable audience bigger should result in a number of other sort of improvements around the way that, you know, content is transmitted, transferred, stored, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, not to sort of say that it'll have fringe benefits, but there are... Um, there are elements of you know the of this sort of move towards even higher quality content that will be of benefit to the consumer, that will be of benefit to content distributors, that will be benefit to you know the advertisers or, or whoever is is actually collecting revenue off the back of it. So you know for all of those reasons, um, I think no, it's it's not a question of let's leave it until you know there's a bigger pipe or whatever. Sure, but Jen, you're. No, I, I do agree with that. I think from my point of view, from my team's point of view, yeah, we probably will slightly put it in a box and not, not worry about it too much at the moment because, again, like I was saying, for us, it's really about the story and the content. But from the point of view of our BAFTA membership and the people making these great films, absolutely, I, I'm, I want them to be striving ahead. I mean, 3D, obviously, it's on a sort of had a funny path, perhaps on a bit of a wane, but I'm still happy that people have embraced that technology and, and made films not just retrofitting into 3D, but actually made films with 3D very much a part of it. I'm thinking of sort of Scorsese Hugo or something, yeah, you know. One, yeah. What amazing films, and I'm so pleased that they've been made and I could enjoy them as a consumer and 
in, in that sort of 3D world. And I think it'll be the same with 4K. You know, what can people do with it? What's, yeah. It's not just about buying a massive TV and watching something. I don't know. Who, who knows what this, this, these clever people will do? Um, I don't know what how virtual reality and whether or not that, that sort of speaks into this, but I think sort of the emergence of that technology is just, that's where I'm really excited about what's going next, you know, Oculus Rift. I can't wait to get my hands on or head in or whichever way it is into one of those. <laughs> that's that's just fantastic. And, you know, I don't want any of those guys to be halting production because they think, well, what's the point? Yeah. So, no, I say go for it. Just that's don't worry. Right. I'm just not going to worry about it just yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think there's a lot of people who are starting to do production in, in 4K because it's, it's a good archive format. It makes your HD look more gorgeous because you've started from a better source. Um, but... BAFTA actually hosted uh, a really great conference a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of the days was on 4K, and you'll have there were places in there like um, the National Theatre, and I just I saw War Horse last night. If, any, if you haven't seen it, amazing, wow! But they, if you can't get to the theatre to see it, they do um, 4K and HD screenings in other theatres, and they had a lot of things to consider through how they were going to do that, and they, they've. It was uh, they they record, recorded it in H.264 and it was 108 megabits per second I think coming down from the satellite and they so they're now looking at Sony who worked with them and they're now looking at doing their next step in H.265 because they want to see if they can improve the the um, well, the size the size of it down to about 30 meg megabits a second so that's what they're hoping for um, but they haven't run the quality tests. So we'll see what, what the quality of H.265 looks like in comparison to what they're doing. But there are things like that that are very practical applications of, of the technology at the moment. Um, but some of the other people who were doing the production there, some of the other things that they were saying was, it isn't just about 4K, it's about things that 4K can bring, like color space so that you, and higher dynamic range. And that some of those things are what's making um, 4K, you know, give, giving more more back from it. And then there, there are now televisions coming out like Dolby's HDR TV, um, which I tried to get to see, and they said it's traveling. I'm like, is there one? <laughs> is there only one? You can see it at IBC. Okay, so I'm like, schedule me in. I will come and see your HDR TV. You know, but I've heard really good things about that. That what's making the difference there is. A higher dynamic range and maybe the color space because we as humans see more green because we had to defend ourselves in, in the wild and be able to differentiate the thing that was in the grass you know and the you know between the leaves and things like that so that as well as um, some of the tests on frame rate uh, you know are having other effects so it's not just about having the bigger thing right. in the room it's about using all of these other aspects of it. And I think that what we're going to see is people create in 4K. And there's a lot of film content being created in 4K right now, which is great. As it starts, you know, it'll come out as HD where it can. Um, Sony is coming out, you know, is coming out or has, has 4K technology. Um, both Sony and Netflix are using IIO to do some of their... Um, to, to make things a little bit more efficient uh, in some of the deliverables. I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. I'm hoping to play with it. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, and they're testing it out. It's what, 15.6 megabits that they're using at the moment. So, but we'll have to just see where, where it goes, but I think you have to start somewhere. And eventually there's some adoption or there's a, menu, a move to other things that maybe we say HDR is better. I'd like to open it up to the, to the floor. Please do ask some questions. Some, some good, good guys. Yeah, please. Just, just on that point, I mean, isn't it the same discussion <coughs> about HD when there wasn't TVs available? Mm -hmm. At the time we did the first iPhone, was it 320 to 40 as well? Mm -hmm. Now you've got HD in your, your iPad resolution is 3000 to 2000. I mean, I, I remember that we, we ran, on my TV, we ran the HD trial in 2006 when we had some seniors and we had an ITPHD test channel and my director of technology beside me told me as the clock was ticking down to the kickoff, you enjoy this because you'll never see HD on 3D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Technology doesn't move faster than you actually think it will yeah. and I think yeah. um, the content will, will get there in terms of resolution and the devices are probably more proliferant on, on mobile devices than on big screen. 
But, but conversely, and, and please allow me to, to represent your former boss as a grumpy old man over here. <laughs> <laughs> an HD TV I can actually fit in my living room. I can't, if I watch HD on, on an iPad, even if it's a retina display, I can't tell the difference. I had to buy glasses this year for the first time. That was much better than any you know, ultra HD or increase of bit rate. And suddenly I could see pixels again. But <laughs> is, there, is there not a kind of like a... A physical constraint that says um, there's not much point going up much further because you can't tell the difference with your eyes. Right. Okay. At the back, sorry, at the back with the blue so, shirt. I think, um, pardon me from the states. I was in Los Angeles, and you know they're filming virtually everything that we saw in 4K, but it's really activity specific. So there are a lot of actors and actresses who absolutely are horrified by the idea mm. of being filmed in 4K. Makeup people are excited because they'll make more money. <laughs> you've got the sports people who absolutely insist that 4K, 8K, you have to have that resolution so you can see the golf ball, you know, the, the, the rendering on the golf ball is being punted across the green. So it's, I think, specific to the, mm. you know, as, as Luke said about what are you trying to get with this content? I think if there's an art image, it doesn't necessarily have to have resolution, but for sports, was the ball in or out? Mm -hmm. You know, how close were they to the line, whatever it happens to be. So I think it's more situational, and that's, it's harder to build hard and fast rules on that. For sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, please? Yes. Um, I used to work for a company called Filmline. It's a little British company. It's, I think it's claimed to fame is it's the only company that's won four SciTech Oscars, um, besides Kodak, it's quite a quite good but we, um, we, we were actually 4K, DCI 4K, back in 2009, I think it was. And we had a whole load of um, British DOPs coming in a room about this size, and we had the, because the third Sony 4K projection in the world on a screen that pretty much matched that. And what we found interesting was that when you showed 2K and 4K side by side, one after the other, everyone said, oh, we love 4K, it's great, 2K is not so good. When you left them for a while, and you left 4K up there, and then you perhaps changed it to 2K, they couldn't differentiate. They, they, it wasn't <laughs> obvious to them what was going on. And that's side a trained DOP. Yeah, 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 it's strange, but that's, that, was, that was the case. Mm. Frankly, anything that sells more uh, sets or allows people to buy more content is great, I think. But, um, <laughs> for some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, Phil, you were a bit uh, scathing of one of the points that Maria made. Of course I. I would agree with her that sometimes SD is actually appropriate. And I actually video stuff in SD mainly because um, it's less likely that my audio channel is going to break up when I watch it later. So if mm. broadband connection goes into a bottleneck phase, then I, and I watch it three days later, then if I record it in SD, then I'm more likely to get that audio through uh, mm -hmm. correctly. And it's one point that we haven't yet made in terms of the quality, but user surveys uh, it, uh, repeatedly show that people are much more tolerant of uh, decrease in the quality of the video than they are of the audio. Um, and perhaps mm -hmm. the, the panel would like to comment uh, on, you know, are we in danger of perhaps forgetting the audio when, as we talk video 4K, 8K, etc.? That's, so, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, and I'm just sort of thinking that I now tend to, I don't know what this, this maybe says something about my hearing, but I now tend to watch uh, television with the subtitles on. So I don't know whether that means that my hearing's bad or whether the audio quality is bad, but I... Um, I'm much more interested now in making sure that the yeah that the audio piece um, of a program, whether I'm watching it on you know an iPad or television or something, uh, that I actually get that as it were. And I'm it's I hadn't thought that that might be as I had to be honest thought it was my hearing, but I'm wondering whether actually the result is that the audio you know that the audio matching isn't working properly, or that that is being as you say maybe being neglected um, in you know in favour of this sort of much sharper picture. Yeah, so I, I agree that the research that you're talking about, we did that over 20 years ago at IBM as well. So, you know, when we're interleaving audio and video, we want to make sure that there's no audio degradation 
because that's more noticeable. And people were putting up with 15 frames a second, 320 by 240 by 15 frames a second, and 256 colors, but the audio was pretty good. It might have been mono, but it was pretty good, you know? And so now we've got... Um, <clears throat> Audio quality is obviously increasing, but true audiophiles still look at things and go, well, what I really want is, is analog audio, because analog is going to give me a continuous waveform instead of discrete sampling, and they'll say that that's what they can hear. So uh, I think we're going to get audio quality only up to a certain level that you can get with, with all of the samples per second, etc., um, without doing it as a, as, a, as a continuous analog waveform. So, but I, I agree, I mean, and then there's all of the different surround sound speaker setups and things like that, and I don't know how many have you have seen the super high vision demo at IBC, but it's got 21.1 surround sound, <laughs> and it's pretty cool. I mean, you actually feel like you're standing outside and you're hearing all of that ambient sound, but then if I talk with that, with specific audiophiles who talk to me about those speakers that are shaped like, what, nautical, what is that? Some of you trendy people will know what these are, you know, those nautical speakers. And then they're kind of like, this is, these speakers, you only need a couple of, a couple of them, you don't need 21.1, and the sound that they give is of an equivalent quality. So they'll tell you that as well. So I think it, it depends. We can start, you know, adding in sort of, what is BAFTA now, 7.1? It's in, the, in yes, our theater? Yes, in yeah. the theater, yeah. Yeah. Um, and... You know, there, there are some, you know, sort of sweet spots where you sit in a certain place and it, you can feel this, you know, the sound that that's where the guy set it up and you can feel that sound better. But I, I don't know how much, you know, how many people are going to have 21.1 speakers in their home. Mm. You know? like a house. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, need, we're gonna need a bigger house with um, you know smart we're home we're technology all built in. We're all we're all moving to back. Yeah, yeah I'm able to move here already. I don't want to move back. Jane, did you want did you want to comment on that? Well, just in that it's interesting. Just the other day, we we had to scrap unfortunately an interview that we did a great interview with Richard Whitey. It was lovely, um, but the sound something had happened with the sound when we recorded it, and our editor had done his best to um, to sort of play with it. But we watched it back, and we just thought it's just. It's just too annoying. I don't mm. think we can put this out. Going back to that issue about quality, it, it looked fine. It looked really mm. nice. It wasn't the most amazingly shot thing in the world, but it did look lovely. Mm -hmm. But we just said, actually, the sound is just not good enough, and we can't mm. put this out as Bafta Guru. It just it really doesn't reflect the brand well, so it had to go. And it was gutting, because it was a great interview, but it was because of the audio quality that we said. Because we knew our you know audiences would probably go, what's this? I can't hear it properly. Yeah. Mm. That was in Archiva earlier on was it this week. And... Uh, the, Sadly, having worked in MCRs in broadcasting for, for most, well, for a lot of my early career, I was sitting in reception and, and the, the audio was completely out of sync with the video. And I was thinking, oh. Oh, can you please come and get me quickly oh. before I have to start complaining to someone? <laughs> but, uh, but maybe yeah. we're a little bit different from the average viewer. I mean, ane anecdotally, well, anecdotally, there are certain teenagers that I've seen that will watch things with almost like a second audio and video out of sync as long as they're just you know actually do you know what they don't are they even, stoned teenagers I, I, i'll ask them when i get <laughs> back but but hopefully they're not but do you know they're not even watching telly anyway half the time are they they're, they're actually watching their phones and their ipads yeah. and these audios coming around and you know it's like watching football in the world cup you can wait 80 minutes for anything of interest and then the commentator starts talking and getting louder and then you look up and you see it and that's how certain teenagers that I know consume their TV now. <laughs> so I don't think they're massively bothered about, um, you know, the quality. But, hey, that's just my personal, personal view. So if we're not... Some are excited about... I get, what I'm getting from you is that UHD, and particularly 4K, is a pretty good mastering format or format for shooting. Yeah, it's a bit more bits and bytes when you come to edit, so it, needs, it sells more CPUs. It's a bit, you know, probably sell some monitors and all sorts, and some people like Telestream will be happy because they can sell more encoders, and Luke will be happy because you can manage it and, and upsell bandwidth and renditions and, mm. and everybody. But what, what else is exciting in technology in the last five or so minutes? What, what, is, what is exciting you, or, what, or how, no, I, I won't say how can you excite me because that could be <laughs> interpreted slightly incorrectly, but, but what... Panels, panelists, tell, tell the audience as they leave tonight, you know, what, what should they really be looking at? So I'm actually, I, I'm going to get in there before Jen does, because she mentioned it already, but I had a, um, a, actually, and as did Maria, but I had a, a sort of practical 
demo or go on one the other day, which was an Oculus Rift. Um, and I met a guy who uh, told me that he'd, he was based out in San Francisco. I wish I could remember the name of the company. Um, he's created some software that takes a video feed directly into an Oculus Rift. And he said it actually they'd built, they'd developed their own codec for this. So I said, all right, you know, what are you using? And he's, no, no, it's, it's pr completely proprietary. And he had um, two, um, two sort of demo pieces of footage, one of which was a roller coaster, and I nearly threw up, and it was really discombobulating. Um, the other one was, um, you know, effectively me standing in a room full of people having a chat with them, and it felt like you were standing in a room with three people having a chat with them. It was, it was quite incredible. Um, and I think, you know, that... Um, you know, you think about some of the some of the incredible possibilities from that sort of technology. You know, of actually transporting people into films. You know, so that they can be sort of second spear carrier and um, you know, gone with the wind or something. That that to me um, is incredibly exciting, um, and I think that's what I'm looking forward to when that sort of experience becomes mm -hmm. a little bit more mass market. And is that professionally with your bright cove hat on, or, yeah. or or personally as your spear carrier? Uh, <laughs> I think personally, but I'm, you know, we're usually like that, me and the company. So. <laughs> Jen? I mean, it's, it's similar. Is it it is, yeah. I have mentioned before, I think that Oculus Rift, I haven't yet tried one, but I'm excited to, um, is really exciting. I think that is going to be sort of the next wave of where, where all our interest goes. Um, and just games in general. I think video games, obviously, it's, there's no secret now, they've sort of merged from being a slightly jokey thing that nerdy boys play in their bedrooms. These like, Now those guys are incredibly cool, earning more money than the rest of us. YouTube channels with gaming people get way more views than the rest of us, mm. and it's just that kind of the kind of um, the emergence of games with film. And I just want I'm interested to see where that will go, and I think that's kind of where Oculus Rift is at the moment, sitting between those two. What mm. what will that what will that do for us? Can we suddenly mm. be in the film? And I guess that really excites me. And on the other side, it's completely away from technology. What excites me is how people are. I suppose it's going back to that point about how do cinemas kind of get around this idea that we're not all now going into the cinema to watch a film and we'll watch it on a iPad instead in our rooms. So what are they doing? Well, people, there's so many pop-up cinemas, and I keep getting more and more emails about them, so they must be working. It's about that going back to that idea of a community and actually that experience of watching a film in a different way. So is it about going to a hot, in a hot tub cinema? Am I sitting in a hot tub with some friends watching it? Or you know, is it about going to secret cinema and suddenly like becoming part of a scene in a film and then going up to watch it? I think kind of it's almost like the opposite of technology it's actually how do we get rid of technology come back all together and enjoy spending time with each other without headsets on so i think that sort of thing in hot really tubs for sure hot tubs. Uh, and marie you're not allowed to mention oculus rift although i think it would be cool so at okay. some point i want to play with that but i was going to mention two other things one sort of leading on from the games thing i had a chance to uh fly a 747 at baft which is british airways flight training facility and it's one of these things it's it's full 3D renders of everything around you, and then it's actually full motion. I mean, it's, ex it's exactly, it's, it's zero hours flight training. So if you can fly on there, you can fly a 747. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, this is where games needs to go to next. This is cool. I mean, it's like nine million pounds for that. I think it's a little bit out of the standard budget. But you know, it's, I thought that was quite fun. Uh, but I still love the idea of flexible OLED and I was at a conference recently where, where one of the guys was being a little cheeky and he said, you know, the women will never let us get, you know, a big screen television. We want a big screen. And it was like, oh, I like the fireplace. I want to see the fireplace, honey. And I thought, I can solve this for you. Flexible OLED rolls up into the ceiling and then it rolls down and you cover your entire wall and then you can have 4K, you can have 8K, you can have super high vision. Um, and I... I'd kind of like to see some of that start happening because we've got, we've got the flexible OLED technology at the moment we're just curving it and it's you know you can roll it up in small things but in the future you might be able to do something like that then you don't have the light pollution coming into something it's it's lit uh, and you can move it out of the way if you don't want to be watching it so those are kind of my two toys for the the future maybe not the immediate future but hopefully some point. Great. And, and you've just excited me about a brand new business opportunity, which is making 4K fireplace videos. So you can leave the screen down all the time. Uh, you're about three minutes away from a cold beer, but if you had one more question, I'm sure we could take it now. I just want to make a comment. I'm Guillermo from Olympic Broadcasting Service. <coughs> we were here two years ago. We were broadcasting the London Olympic Games. 
uh, we were showing the Super High Vision uh, NHK with BBC were promoting it. And it's just commenting that uh, in our situation where we have to broadcast the games every two years, uh, of course we cannot keep the pace year after year of technology, so we have to look ahead. Um, but just to give a, a view, uh, NHK is definitely pushing for 8K for 2020 games. <coughs> it's in the home country. Mm -hmm. They want to show off, they want to do transmission in 8K. They, uh, they say that it's, that's it, 8K, that there's nothing else after that. <coughs> so there's the final, that's the border they say. So the question is why stop or why go through 4K where 8K just is right there. And even if it's just on the production side, and then we just transmit in 4K or sure. HD, whatever. Um, in our case, we are not going to, uh, our standard for a real Olympic game would be 1080i. Uh, that doesn't mean that there can be any occasional you know, 4K stuff. Definitely 8K for sure, in this case, will be a game we are showing. Um, but I agree with uh, Maria, what she was saying, that the benefits, the collateral benefits according to this format, being a uh, higher uh, dynamic range, better color space, or even uh, faster frame rates are definitely some benefits that you can uh, get from these uh, new formats. And just to point out that the audio uh, thing as well, it's true, I don't know who will ever put this uh, 22.1 uh, system at home. Definitely there are down mixes and algorithms that can simulate that, that in two channels. Other companies like uh, Dow or other companies are dealing with that. But just to point out uh, what was said before as well, that audio is definitely something that it requires more quality compared to what the video quality is offering. We shouldn't forget that. And also the fact that millions of people are uh, hearing audio without video, and not so many watching video without audio. It's just to give a, yes. a point into audio which many times in these type of forums is often uh, not properly addressed. Well, thank you. You're absolutely right. Uh, talking to Jen earlier about BAFTA, you still do audio-only podcasts, don't you? We do. Yeah. It's my so, favourite part. <laughs> and you do very, very well with them. Thank you. You've been a really lovely audience, actually, getting really involved. And thank you so much. Can I just thank Jen and Luke and Maria for the panel? And uh, please do enjoy your drinks. Thanks very much.